Um, welcome to our um, second session of the workshop series now it will be heard on tools of direct democracy on a global level. Um, just like the technical ba um, basics you've probably all heard already, uh, please respect each other in speech and also in the chat. Um, please stay muted uh, when you don't want to say something and if you want to say something use the raise hand function or write in the chat. Um, and you probably noticed already we're recording this session to um, make uh, put it on YouTube afterwards and also do a quick um, summary video of the session, which you can later find on YouTube. If you want to remain anonymous, you can switch off the camera and maybe change your name. Um, and yeah, so maybe some of you have already been to our last session. Um, of this workshop on the UNWCI, so you might know exactly how this workshop works. Um, but for everybody else, we made these workshops, um, tried to make them a little different, more interactive and interesting than the usual panel discussions. Um, we sent out three challenges um, ahead of time to get you um, interested in the topic and also give you some information. Um, Oh, talking about the challenges, we have prepared um, a little poll for you to maybe uh, see who of you uh, did the challenges and who not. If you didn't do the challenges, don't worry, that's completely fine. Um, exactly, you should have seen see the poll now. Uh, just fill that out while I still talk. I'm still talking. Uh, so, and if you have done the challenges, um, that's pretty good. And uh, today we want to just recap um, what you sent us as your answers on these challenges and also do a like critical debate on the UN Parliamentary Assembly. Uh, so who am I? I'm Kim, Kim Graves. I work at Democracy International and I organized um, these workshops. And uh, Democracy International is an international NGO seated in Cologne who supports uh, democracy activists around the world, and also campaigns for more direct, direct democratic tools on a trans transnational level. Uh, democracy International is part of the We the People's campaign that calls for more democratic and inclusive uh, United Nations by suggesting three institutional changes into the UN framework, the World Citizens Initiative that we talked about last time, two weeks ago, the Parliamentary Assembly, which we'll talk about today, um, a civil society envoy, which we'll talk in two weeks from now, uh, and the idea of the global citizens assemblies. Uh, another organization central to the We the People's campaign is um, Democracy Without Borders. Uh, they are the leading organization involved in the campaign for the UN Parliamentary Assembly, which is why we are so extremely happy uh, to welcome Andreas Brumme, uh, to here today, who is the director of Democracy Without Borders, and also Yvonne Soares, uh, who is a member of the Mozambican Parliament and is a long-term supporter of the UNPA. Uh, what are we doing next? Daniela will give us a recap on the uh, on the challenges and show us the results. Uh, after that, Andreas will present us the idea of the UN Parliamentary Assembly a bit more closely than what you have read in the challenges. Um, then we'll have just really short time for questions, any technical questions you might still have um, on the Parliamentary Assembly, nothing too critical, you have to wait until the part after that uh, in our Devil's Advocates dis discussion, which will be uh, kicked off by uh, Yvonne giving us a one minute pitch on why the UNPA is such a good idea. Um, in which after that, I will try to argue why it isn't a good idea. Um, and you and the experts try to argue against me and we'll see where we come after that. And thank you very much, Dana, Daniela. How were the challenges? Yeah, thanks a lot, Kim. Um, so we closed the poll for the challenges. I will just share the results. Unfortunately, because I'm the host, I cannot see the results. So uh, maybe Kim, you can <laughs> just say really quick who did participate in the challenges. I only uh, see 0%. Uh, it looks like about two thirds didn't do the challenges, but a, a third of us did. And thank God there are no, nobody who had any technical issues. 
Okay, great. So we can review then the challenges for those of you who didn't take part and some of you who did, maybe then you have some follow up questions. Uh, I will just share my screen here just a second with the first challenge. Okay, yes. Yeah, so as, uh, as I mentioned, these are the, the, the first of a, th a three set of challenges um, that you should have received in the last few days. This one you should have received on uh, Friday. Um, and the first challenge uh, is here on the question, uh, why is there no global democracy and what are the democratic uh, definite, uh, deficits of global governance as we know it? Uh, I'm not going to read uh, through all of them, but maybe here are some points um, I can just highlight. Um, I can skim through here some answers, the, the power of member states uh, over global, uh, global institutions, um, that there are organizational challenges, uh, because leaders have failed to have peace and have resorted to conflicts for so long. Um, we have here also because nations um, should be divided into regions um, that can be socially, economically independent. Uh, we have also an answer because of the UN um, Security Council veto, power issue, uh, and lastly, of course, the political will. That seems to always, of course, always be a, <laughs> a, a challenge. Uh, so let me just skip through them to the second. Are you seeing the second challenge? Okay, I just have to find it in between all my windows on my screen. Okay, so the second challenge, uh, who supports the UN Parliamentary Assembly and which nation even has parliamentarians that support the idea? Um, there are a couple answers here. Maybe then <laughs> later Andreas and Yvonne can um, can set the record straight for us, but we have anywhere between 1,600 members of parliament, 1,700 members of parliament from either 100 countries or 135 countries. Um, somebody also spoke to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, uh, um, Canadian Prime Minister, um, who has endorsed the UNPA campaign uh, himself. Um, yes, and also 63% of survey uh, representing 61% of the world population. Um, so maybe we have a little bit more facts from this later um, from Ivan and from Andreas. Now the third challenge, which you should have received on uh, Tuesday, yesterday. And I just have to find it behind all my windows. Okay, uh, what are the technical details of the um, UN Parliamentary Assembly campaign that you find interesting or even problematic? Um, there are questions about, um, could it work? Can the, organ and can the organization be driven by sustainable development goals? Um, there is also a comment about uh, that there are too many parliaments, city, providence, region, um, that should be simplified uh, to the executive power level. Um, and uh, referring also then to the example of the European Parliament, um, which the, uh, has no permanent seats, but conforms also the vote. Uh, and then also comment about um, how UNPA could be established uh, by simple vote within the General Assembly um, based on the UN Charter. So maybe we can get um, a little bit more um, yeah, clarification from, from Andreas and from Ivan here. Uh, I think now at this point, we can also hand it over to Andreas and you can maybe reflect on some of this in your, uh, your overall and um, introduction of the UNPA campaign. Uh, you'll also slide, share the screen now and maybe you can touch on some of these comments and react to them. Um, thank you very much, um, Kim, for the introduction and Daniela for presenting these uh, results and to uh, Democracy International, a big thank you for organizing this very interesting webinar series. And, and we are very, very delighted to participate in, in this session, particularly on the UN Parliamentary Assembly. As Kim indicated, Democracy Without Borders, an organization I represent today, has been at the forefront of the efforts for a UN Parliamentary Assembly since an international campaign for this proposal was started in 2007. And I, um, I have the task to make a super quick seven minute, I think even five minute presentation on this proposal, which is a big challenge because it is kind of complex. 
And um, we already saw that um, when um, Daniela presented the, the results because we have many levels that need to be addressed. Uh, first, of course, why, why do we need it? What, what, you know, what is the character of the democratic deficit um, that the uh, proposal wishes uh, to address? Then how can it be established, um, you know, technically, how would it be designed? And of course, um, how, what um, needs to be done and can be done to push forward its implementation. Um, because it's uh, such little time, I prepared a few slides that will force me to um, adhere to a certain structure. And that's um, why I will now start that um, presentation and share my screen. Um, so hang on for a minute. Um, so here we go. Um, first of all, in concerning the democratic deficit, the um, challenge results refer to the um, non-democratic UN Security Council, um, which is correct um, in terms of the veto power of the five permanent members. Um, nonetheless, in terms of the UN Parliamentary Assembly, I think the main, the main um, democratic deficit it wishes to address is that um, at the UN and intergovernmental organization, by definition, it's only representatives of the executive branches of governments who are in those bodies. And the UN Parliamentary Assembly will change that. And it has, a, and so far, a cosmopolitan, citizen, people-centered character. And if we would like to um, understand the democratic deficit of the UN, we can look at this slide, which shows that the principle of one country, one vote leads to heavy imbalances. And so far, citizen representation is concerned because as you can see on, on the slide, if we look mathematically at the 128th uh, least populous countries, um, according to the principle of one country, one vote, they have a two thirds majority in the UN General Assembly, although they only represent 8.4% of the world's population. In a national domestic context, we would hardly consider, hardly consider that democratic. And now um, the key features of a UN Parliamentary Assembly. Um, first of all, I, I, I need to stress that the best way to understand the proposal of UN Parliamentary Assembly is to look at it as a process and not as a final goal. So this means that the UN Parliamentary Assembly will be started most likely in a very pragmatic fashion, but that would not be the end of the story. That's really the key to understand it, that it would start in a certain shape and form in a certain way, but the idea really is that um, once that has been achieved, that the assembly would develop further, actually up to the point of becoming a real global parliament. So this is reflected in the key features of a UN parliamentary assembly that you can see on the slide. Um, first of all, it uh, would be complementary to existing um, international bodies and organizations in the UN. It would not replace them, but complement them. In particular, the UN General Assembly, we are not saying the executive branches of governments and member states should not be represented. We are saying that that representation is not enough. Citizens need to have a more direct voice. So I already talked about the step-by-step -step approach, which means that for instance, implementation, or let's say rather the creation of the assembly could be done by the UN General Assembly itself using Article 22 of the UN Charter. Um, one technical detail that was mentioned by someone um, as a response to the challenges. That is in fact a very pragmatic thing that could be done. Um, especially the irony is that um, if, you, if we wanted to change the Security Council and even add one more seat to the 15 member council, that would require an amendment of the UN Charter, which is extremely difficult. There are many hurdles. And setting up a parliamentary assembly at the UN is easier because the General Assembly could do it using that. And then the next important item would be that it would move probably from indirect to direct elections. At the beginning, it could be national parliamentarians who already sit in the national parliaments who could um, be delegated to the UN Parliamentary Assembly. And over time, more and more of those um, delegates or representatives would be directly elected. And also the principle, how the seats would be allocated could develop. At the beginning, 
it would certainly ha would have to be um, be some kind of weighed um, and balanced um, distribution of seats. But over time, it would develop into the direction of one person, one vote. Um, so that is um, this, um, you know, statement here from degressive to direct proportionality, which refers to to demographics um, of the population of member states. Then from consultative functions to real powers, which means at the beginning, um, it would be basically a forum and an oversight, a watchdog at the UN. But over time, it could perhaps develop together with the UN General Assembly into a real world legislature. And one key feature that we insist on is really that um, opposition and minorities would have to be included. So, and one other, key component that we need to insist on is that the representatives in the assembly would organize their work in national, transnational political groupings. So um, if we think about the slide I showed just before, in, in the UN parliamentary assembly, it, would, it wouldn't even be possible to actually identify countries because countries are not members. Who are members in the, in the um, parliamentary assembly that is individual representatives? They certainly come from some, you know, their origin is, um, you know, some country, but they are not there to represent that country, but they are there to represent the best interest of humanity. And um, one more um, slide here on the political groups. This is just an example we can draw upon in the European Parliament. You know, in the European Parliament, you do not have national groups like a French group, a German group, a Belgian group, or whatever, you have transnational groups that are organized according to political ideology, like a green group, a socialist group, a conservative group, and you can see some of them here in this, in, on this slide with their share of seats in the ninth legislative term of the European Parliament. So in the UN Parliamentary Assembly, we would see something similar happening. There would be a global conservative group, a global um, ecological group, I, I guess, and, and others, um, and not geopolitical groups. Um, the possible rights and functions of the UN Parliamentary Assembly, some of them are listed on the slide. I will not go through all of them um, because we are short of time and I want to respect that. Nonetheless, I would like to indicate that even at the beginning, if it is a more or less consultative body, there are quite important things that the Assembly could do. In particular, I would like to point out that it should be in a position to establish inquiry committees into global matters. For instance, in my opinion, um, a UN Parliamentary Assembly was missing um, to investigate tax evasion and the international tax system. It is also missing to investigate um, government's reactions to the COVID crisis. It is missing in, in many respects and such independent parliamentary inquiries, I believe, could be very useful. So um, one slide about the support the proposal has had in, in a couple of surveys um, I am showing now. And this is um, a survey that was carried out in the countries that you can see here a while ago. Um, there are not many empirical studies that um, measure the support across the world. So this was the, the last one. And you can see that on the global average, 63 of um, respondents in these um, representative studies across those countries said that they agree that there should be a new UN parliament made up of um, directly elected representatives and that has equal powers to the current um, UN General Assembly. Um, it was mentioned that we are running a new campaign um, since this year or a little bit longer um, on, that is um, called We the Peoples. We the Peoples, of course, refers to the first um, words of the UN Charter, which was declared in the name of We the Peoples. So um, this campaign is pushing forward a set of free recommendations, and one of them is the UN Parliamentary Assembly proposal. And um, I would like to finish um, this very short uh, presentation by saying that the UN Parliamentary Assembly, as this webinar um, actually indicates, is uh, not the only proposal that is, uh, or, or element that is required to democratize global governance and to make global governance more effective. Um, but I believe, um, although it is just a piece in the puzzle, it is probably the most important piece because um, a UN Parliamentary Assembly would not only be an institution that pushes forward democratization of the UN and in member states, but it, um, through its nature and the new dynamism it would bring about, it would also be a tool for change in the system 
something that is really missing at this point as the new report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has just showed once again. So of course, I did not um, address everything that is important, but that should be sufficient to get us started. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andreas. Um, we already had a few questions in the chat, but they weren't that. I think they are more suitable for our second part. Does anybody have just technical details, questions for Andreas? Has anybody not quite understood what the UNPA is supposed to do? Please just write in the chat or raise your hand. I mean, if you understood anything, everything, then that's Perfect. Good job, Andreas. <laughs> There's maybe we can formulate a question from uh, Jeff, um, who made a comment about that a UN par parliament of 1,000 representatives is, is too small for the world population. This is maybe something more for the for the second part, but maybe we can formulate the question um, why uh, 1,000 representatives and how uh, did you come up with this? Uh, did I say that there should be 1,000 representatives? I don't think so, but oh, I, also don't know. <laughs> I, I certainly can address the question of the size of the assembly, because I think, indeed, if we consider the allocation of seats in this assembly, the starting point should be to talk about what is the maximum size, um, because I think there is a maximum size that needs to be set and that should be measured according to the efficiency of the, of the, of the body. So I believe that if um, the assembly has more than 1,000 um, representatives, it becomes inefficient. And there would have to be subgroups and subcommittees anyway to organize the work. So that's why we eventually came up with um, a, a size of around 800 representatives and 1,000 at most. I, yes, that's actually in, included in, in one of the recent policy papers. So that's probably where this, this comes from. So um, to, to make it a long story short, um, it's about the efficiency and the larger, that's our um, you know, assumption, the larger the body is, the more inefficient it, it becomes. Uh, yes, Jeff. Yes, may I say something to that? Uh, the thousand is effective a maximum that you can put together but um, it's not enough to represent the world. And on the other hand, a representative who is there for four to five years has not all the necessary uh, knowledge for all the issues that are treated by the parliament. And then I propose we, we uh, indicate representatives per issue, per topic. And they are paid by those who indicate them. And then you have together perhaps 10,000 representatives, but in a meeting, there are 200 to 500 people. And that is then more efficient. And those who are present are competent to discuss the topic. That is what I want to say, if it is clear. <laughs> There are also, yes, thank, thank you very much, Jeff, for that comment. There are two questions uh, in the chat, one by Silvana and then uh, Antonio. Silvana asks um, how to reconcile the complementarity and the co-decision of uh, UMPA and UNGA. Well, essentially, I would say that the parliamentary assembly would be able to shadow the work of the general assembly from a more um, open and parliamentary perspective. And eventually it depends on really what stage of development we are talking about. So that's what I mean. We have to look at it as a process. In our discussion, we always need to identify, are we talking about this first step, initial parliamentary assembly, which is a, has a very different character from the final, let's call it final stage world parliament, right? So if we talk about the vision of a global parliament, 
then I would imagine that um, the, the Assembly of States, which is today's UN General Assembly, and the Parliamentary Assembly would have to adopt concurrent um, legislation, so to speak, right? So there would have to be committees to coordinate uh, their work. I don't know. Um, at the initial stage, it, it would not be that close, I, I, um, I assume. And there's the question from Antonio from Spain. Uh, I think actually we could reserve it for the next part because uh, I think this is also a very good question for the um, Davos Advocate section. Um, there is one last question by John. Do any other parliaments work this uh, this way? The question about 10,000 members. Uh, we, are there any, any other responses to that? I think we'd, we, we address that briefly. Well, I'm not exactly sure whether, I mean, um, Jeff has put forward a specific proposal how it could be designed and work, right? Based on 10,000 delegates. I didn't completely understand the proposal, um, but um, it's, you know, what came to my mind is that, I mean, even in a 1,000 member parliamentary assembly, the work of course would be organized according to portfolio committees which means that naturally all members of the assembly would um, try to become members of that portfolio committee and those subcommittees that fit best to their expertise. So I don't know if you have somebody with a health education background, that person would probably try to join a committee that is dealing with the World Health Organization or the pandemic, you know. So, um, so of course, in, in, in all parliaments, it works that way that um, delegates or representatives, MPs, end up um, working on issues they are, they are closest to. And otherwise, I'm, I'm not exactly, uh, I don't exactly understand what the other proposal is, but um, maybe we can come back to it also later, because I understand that um, we'll, we'll have the, another Q&A session. Yes, I think there are some good questions coming in, but I think we can reserve these for the uh, for the devil's advocate section. Um, so I think now, uh, Kim, you can uh, you can introduce that a uh, little bit how that will work, and then we'll hear from Yvonne. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, so this next part will be our discussion, which will be kicked off by Yvonne, passionately arguing for uh, the UNPA, uh, and directly after that, maybe one. Um, I will share a, like a, a common point um, why this might not even be a good idea. And from there on, we'll just get rolling. We have so many questions already in the chat. Um, we will have no lack of, uh, of content here. So Yvonne, please uh, tell us what you think it's a good idea. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's nice to see some familiar faces. <laughs> Thank you to all. Uh, the new climate uh, report that was published uh, two days ago shows that uh, humanity is facing dire conditions and millions are already suffering uh, the consequence of climate change. Uh, extreme weather events will become more severe and more often. Uh, tropical storms will be more frequent in my home country, Mozambique, for instance. Uh, the climate emergency is only one of many global challenges. Uh, another one that uh, uh, has hit uh, us all is of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Experts tell us that uh, uh, more new virus outbreaks will come. Maybe they will be more uh, deadly than COVID. I fear that we are not prepared uh, we need strong global institutions that can deal with uh, global challenges more effectively. Uh, we need the collaboration that goes behind uh, the interests of individual governments. We need global institutions that uh, have uh, sufficient legitimacy uh, for the effective global action. Uh, this legitimacy can be provided by a parliamentary body that represents the voice uh, of the people. And uh, 
a UN Parliamentary Assembly will be a central world forum of elected representatives that uh, provides, provides for fair representation of all people over the world. Uh, the assembly uh, would bring together representatives who are independent from governments to discuss uh, global problems from a global perspective and to work out global solutions and uh, benefit all uh, of humanity and future generations in the best possible way. Uh, this new assembly will be more than one, only a, a forum. Uh, it will be uh, in a position to push uh, forward recommendations and promote their implementation. Uh, governments would uh, face increased political pressure for global responsibility. And finally, over time, the assembly should develop into a real world parliament. Uh, it would be a first step that this step needs to be done now. And I think uh, if we give this uh, step, we will collaborate for a better uh, place where all the people can have good representatives uh, like me, because I'm a member of parliament. And if we have uh, people that can uh, discuss our issues uh, without corruption involved, I think we can make a, a good, a good way forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Yvonne. Um, first of all, like, I understand your point and it makes sense, but I want to address maybe the elephant in the room how exactly, what's the plan to make the member states actually support this idea? Uh, we obviously need them to implement uh, the UNPA, but what incentives are there for countries like maybe China that might not basically fit into this nice chart of the political spectrum um, idea that, like, why would they support this? Well, uh, I think even Chinese people are wondering about the real democracy. And uh, this kind of uh, democracy where a big party controls uh, what uh, you think, what you say, and if you doesn't say what they want to hear, you are killed. I think this will not uh, uh, continue because in the hand, the democracy is the best way to, to drive the, the nation. And we have to make sure that all the people understand that. And if we, the Chinese uh, wants to, to stay as a relevant uh, partner in the world, they must make changes. Uh, and I think that uh, this will happen uh, in the hand, this will happen because I don't think that uh, with all the billions of people that the they world has, uh, we will still have uh, this kind of uh, Chinese democracy that they are selling also to African corrupt governments. I don't think that this will prevail forever. And uh, all of us, we have to make sure that this kind of good governance that uh, in democracy is possible to have where you have people uh, responding for their uh, actions, I think is the best way. And it's really important to make sure that uh, there is a, a transparency and only in a democratic uh, situation you can find uh, the parliament where you can have people elected uh, to pressure the executive to make what they promise in their campaigns. And it's important to have this uh, situation where democracy stands for the three powers, but not three powers only to the uh, 
to, to, to only to show off the three powers where they effectively uh, works independently, but coordinating also the, the agents and uh, to serve the best in the best way uh, all the people. I don't know if you understand or if this. Uh, Are you there? Yes, definitely. Um, I, 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 oh, do, okay. I do understand. Um, I, well, I can't say I agree because I'm the counter, the, the con party here. But um, Frank, you had a question in the chat. Do you want to uh, say it out loud? Uh, yes, I can. Uh, Yvonne, I think your interesting thoughts. My prime. Primary thoughts are that um, about bureaucracy. I think uh, my experience is that bureaucracy is is inefficient. It's not it's not um, something that increases innovation, and uh, there's often lack of transparency. So my thoughts are: how do we use technology, not least, to to drive that, to drive and to involve more people? Um, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I think that with uh, technology, if we can, for Africa, for example, because I'm here, it's more, more easy to, to talk about the, the Africa continent. Uh, if we can make sure that the, all African people, for example, can uh, has, uh, have access to internet, to the technologies, to use of uh, the uh, IT, if uh, the African people can have electricity, if they can have a computer, I think we can move forward because in this moment, there is a lot of bureaucracy, yes, it's true. There, there is lack of transparency, yes, it's true also. And there is a lot of corruption, it's true. And uh, in Mozambique, for example, now we have terrorism in the north of the country because we have oil and gas. And uh, all these things, uh, that is happening in Africa, uh, even if Africa is a richest continent in terms of uh, virgin soils where we can uh, find uh, resources to, to explore and transform and make the, the, the countries uh, rich, uh, we have these governments that uh, doesn't have to, 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 to answer to the, their parliaments. The, the executives in Africa, they do what they want to do without considering democracy systems that are uh, in their countries. And for that, I think I stand for democracy without borders, because if we can make sure that all ordinary people understand uh, their rights and they have access to education, if they have access to food, I think their brain will be able to understand that they can be better uh, driven by the, the, by the executive. But in this moment, uh, without all these things that you are talking about, without the lack of transparency, without bureaucracy, without uh, with the democracy, with the, the lack of transparency, and with the, all these uh, problems, uh, social problems that I'm talking, uh, you, you see that it's difficult to a person to think about the democracy because they, they, first of all, when they wake up, they are thinking what they will eat. And in midday, they think what they will eat again. And in the night, they think what they will eat in the next day. This is the main problem of the people in, in, in Africa. Uh, in Europe and in Asia, I think uh, they don't have these problems of what they will eat, like in Mozambique, like in other 54 uh, African countries. Uh, the problems are of another level, not uh, what they will eat, what, where they will find medicine, where they will find uh, proper uh, security. But uh, each continent has their own problems, but in the end, all the people are seeking for good governance. All the people are seeking for democracy. All the people are seeking to, to have someone that listens to their voice, to their problems, 
and someone is taking care of their rights. And uh, for that, I think it's important to push this movement and to make sure that we can have this uh, UN Parliamentary Assembly where all countries can make sure that global institutions uh, works for what they stand without uh, corruption, without uh, all these big problems that we face uh, daily uh, in, in the poorest countries. There was maybe, uh, I would just come, yes, uh, Andreas, I wanted to just bring you in because uh, Yvonne just touched on this a bit. There was a question by um, Antonio about how um, how do you think people living in non-democratic countries could be included in UNPA elections? Yvonne touched on this a little bit. Maybe you can uh, also respond to this and maybe um, respond to this question too in your answer. Yeah, I think it's really good that we have a global pers more global perspective in this discussion today that um, brings to mind really the difficult situation and, and the unequal uh, situation that people are faced with globally. Um, so in, in terms of, of bureaucracy, I just wanted to mention that of the, the Parliamentary Assembly um, as a watchdog, a political watchdog in the UN system might also help push bureaucracy forward in terms of innovation and, 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 and you know, politically put pressure on them to consider innovative mechanisms and, and, and that. So that's part of, of our thinking here. And in terms of, of democratic countries, first, I, I think we would have to identify what makes a, demo, a country democratic and from when on would we say it's not democratic? That's already opening up the question, you know, how do we measure democracy and how, how do we make such an assessment that the country is democratic or not. That is a, a key problem here, which is why we ended up saying we cannot solve that problem. We cannot even identify who is going to make that assessment in the current system. And that's why we said all countries should be able to send delegates. And of course, having said all that, we know some countries, and one has been mentioned already, are you know one-party dictatorships. There's no question about that. And we need to acknowledge that at this stage, in these countries, democratic elections for a parliamentary assembly are not possible. That's simply a reality. So again, we need to look at the UNPA as a process. At the beginning, it would be consultative. Everybody would know that delegates from certain countries speak for the government, yes? So they would give speeches, everybody would know they are speaking for the government and not, um, you know, not freely as, as independent delegates. So that um, mitigates the problem. And over time, the assembly should get more rights and functions as its democratic legitimacy increases. So it has been determined long ago already that in the campaign for UN parliamentary assembly, that a parliamentary assembly only then should have the power to adopt binding regulation on global matters together with other bodies if it is fully democratic. So that's, and I need to stop here so my answer does not, not, does not become too long, but it really indicates that national democratization and global democratization, they, they go, they are interlinked. There was also earlier in the chat uh, a question by Christoph uh, about whether the UN should divide in different sectors, so in finance, environment, justice, uh, and so on, uh, in a comment to that by Jeff that it's, uh, it is better to appoint representatives for each theme. Um, I don't know, uh, Andreas or Yvonne, if you want to respond to that. Yvonne, would you like to go first? Otherwise, I can say something about it too. Uh, I, I had the noise of my baby here, please, I don't, I didn't get the, right. the, the question, yeah, sorry. Then, then I will respond. I mean, the UN system, I mean, we got the core UN, you know, that has the main bodies, the General Assembly, the Security Council, the Economic and Social Council, and so on. And 
in addition to the core UN, we got the whole UN system that is composed of like 36 entities. And if you look at that whole system, we already got some division according to issues. You know, um, we got the industrial development organization, we got the environmental program, you know, we have UN women, um, we have UNDP, you know, the UN development program. So um, name it, it's, it's 36 bodies that are already um, specialized. So I would say my answer to the question is, that's already the case. But I would turn it around and say, isn't the current system too fragmented? Where is the central, you know, where is the central coordination? Where, how is this effective if we have, if we have dozens of, of organizations dealing essentially with the same stuff? And, and there's not always overlap, you know? So, so the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, they would propose some project and other UN institutions would oppose the project and, and it's, at, it's at odds with each other. So I believe that instead of separating it more into silos, what we actually need to do is decrease fragmentation and send, I mean, I know centralization is not a word that is, is, has any sex appeal, but let's face it, we need more centralization. And I think a UN parliamentary assembly, the plenary that brings together the committees and the subcommittees can really help um, with overcoming this fragmentation and help humanity set priorities across the system. Thank you for that. And there's, there's maybe uh, there are some questions also by Frank we can still get to, but um, Kim, I don't know if you had any other uh, devil's advocate questions you also want to put forward before we get uh, back to the chat. Well, I do. I was thinking as Andreas was talking about the whole idea of the process, um, which makes a lot of sense. Um, but I was wondering how exactly this process will be pushed. Like we could establish like the first stages, um, I think he's called them, um, in, the, in the framework. And then how could we ensure that it actually turns out to be a, a world parliament in the end. Yvonne, would you like to take it up or should I respond? All right, so, and so far I'm concerned, I believe um, we really, need to move forward based on you know collecting experience and doing one step after the other and an example we are drawing on is the is the european parliament that has started as a largely consultative body composed of national parliamentarians and then in 1970 from 1979 on it was directly elected and it got more power um, and it, um, pushed forward european integration so I believe that um, a consultative assembly at the beginning is like getting the foot into the door and then progressive members of the assembly themselves would most likely promote strengthening the assembly because no, no such you know, serious member would wish to be a member of a consultative body only. They, they would like to gather power. And I think that's, that's really, what makes this interesting, because um, civil society, in my in my view, has largely failed in over thirty years to push forward systemic reform of global governance, and now with the parliamentary assembly, we would have a publicly financed body, um, some members of which would be able to address um, this systemic change, and actually they would sit in the body that would be the vehicle for that. Well, and it, as I mentioned before, it relates to democratization in, in the world of states as well. It's, yeah. Maybe we can go back to the, to the chat for some of the questions. There were questions by Frank, um, two of them. Uh, what is the role of artificial intelligence in helping us make decisions? So it's a more broader question. 
uh, but maybe we can link into the parliamentary assembly question. Uh, and what is the role of social media in facilitating communication and finding out what people uh, need in this uh, regard to what extent are meetings among few people in physical rooms needed? I think, can I? Are you listening to me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead, Ivan. Ah, okay. <laughs> yes, I think that uh, with this pandemic situation, uh, to have uh, more networking through social media or through uh, webinars and all these uh, virtual uh, solutions that we are uh, uh, trying to put on because of the impossibility to, to meet each other face to face uh, because of this situation. Uh, a lot of uh, countries are in, uh, uh, they close their, their borders, no? I think with this new, the new normal uh, is necessary to invest more in the social uh, media, social networks. And maybe it could be really important to make sure that uh, the access uh, to internet as a human right uh, are implemented by all gov governors to, to, to make sure that the people are uh, in line with the, what is going on in, in the world. And uh, to, to face this, I saw here this artificial intelligence. I think, let me find the question here. I think that we we can deal we can deal with the, with that uh, in a way that uh, in Africa, for example, uh, is difficult now to to talk with the ordinary people in the in the bush where they never saw a mobile phone to talk with them about artificial intelligence. Uh, but uh, if we are talking with people that are in the universities, uh, this is another story because they are more uh, informed, more prepared, and uh, they, they, they are studying and they, they can understand uh, what is going on and what they want, and they can explain what they, they want. Uh, yeah. It's, it's not easy because we have uh, two, three realities. We have the realities in the countries that uh, are in, uh, without uh, this lack of uh, uh, food problems, no? sanitary pro problems. And we have the countries where we are in an intermediate uh, situation where some people have too much and some people have nothing. And we have another third reality where there is only poverty and war. And in the countries where we are facing terrorism, where we are facing war, civil wars, it's really difficult to go there and talk about the, all this stuff that we are dealing with. But we have to make sure that all of them can be in the same boat with us and uh, all of them can be pushed uh, to, to, to be uh, in the normal world, no? the normal world where we, we know our rights and we exercise our rights to talk, our rights to access to information, because the main uh, goal is to ac uh, access to information. Uh, not information that are filtered, by the governments, but uh, any kind of information. And uh, if you go, for example, to China, I went to China a couple of times, and uh, it's impossible to 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 go to Facebook when you are in China. Uh, they have their own uh, uh, social networks, and I don't know if they changed it in the last month. But uh, uh, when I was there, I was everything blocked, no? And another countries, they block, for example, Google. And uh, how we can talk about all these guys living in this kind of countries about uh, artificial intelligence. I don't know if you understand my point, but uh, 
uh, when we deal with this, uh, I think we have to make it, we strategize thinking about all levels of, uh, of uh, the different groups of people uh, that needs our help to, to make sure that the right to talk, the right to ac access to information are respected by all govern governments. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Yvonne. There's one last question in the chat, and then I think uh, we can then wrap up. Um, that's a question by Peter, and that's um, which have been the most important achievements of the campaign for uh, UNPA so far, and uh, what can we do then to help promote the proposal further? Should I address that? Sure. Well, I mean, if we look at the last, like, I don't know, 15 years or so, I would say the, the main achievement is that the proposal is on the map, um, you know, in the most general sense. No, no academic and no politician, no diplomat can actually speak any longer about making the UN more democratic and people-centered and, and so on without considering this proposal. And that's, I think, the basic achievement that we have, right? Of course, we need to really move strongly forward in terms of political implementation, but this is, this is the foundation. If we go back 20 years, it was an obscure, you know, historic proposal that's been around since almost the French Revolution, even before the UN existed, you know, well, who cares? Um, you, would, you would find academic papers about a more democratic UN that wouldn't even mention the proposal, or perhaps a footnote here or there, and, and that's it. And now this is completely different. This proposal has, you know, it's kind of center stage in the debate and everybody who doesn't, who ignores it actually, you know, is, is not a serious um, contributor to this. So that's the main achievement. And otherwise, I mean, I think one of the most important steps really was taken this year, um, actually, when we started or expanded the We the People's campaign, which has achieved the support by now of 170 um, NGOs uh, groups across the world. It's a very diverse um, set of groups, which includes very small rural initiatives, um, for instance, in Africa, but also Asia, and, it, and up to some of the largest NGOs on the planet, like the Nature Conservancy or Greenpeace, who are working on the environment, but also other coalitions, like the coalition for the UN we need, or uh, Together 2030, which itself is a, is a coalition of hundreds of organizations. So um, this is really, I think, the main achievement. And uh, nonetheless, uh, a lot more will have to be done and need to happen for member states to take up the proposal. And, and that's been, I think, raised at, um, rather at the beginning of this, of this event. Um, what can we do and what do we need to do to bring uh, member states on board. And in terms of democracies, we spoke a lot about the autocracies, but in terms of the democracies, I think the game changing moment will be when high level politicians recognize that their voters um, want them to support it. Once they recognize it's popular, you know, they will switch their opinion from one day to the next and pick it up and promote it. So that's actually in democracies, the one thing that we need to achieve. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I think that was a really, really good ending of this um, this session. Uh, I would thank. I want to thank everybody who participated. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you, Yvonne, for being here and answering our questions. Um, I also want to thank the GLS Treuhand because they are financing this project. Um, and if you are interested in more of uh, more the direct democratic tools on the global level, you can come back to this uh, workshop in two weeks on the 25th of August. It's the same link, it's the same time. Uh, we will send the challenges before and uh, thank you very much. <laughs>